Welcome to Levitate Live with me, Ryan Nell. It's good to see you here. Uh, I thought I would change up the background today. Being my poor, long-suffering housemate has put up with four weeks of me banishing from him from my kitchen every lunchtime to do these sessions. So, um, so, uh, so instead, I'm I'm in my bedroom. Um, so that feels like a good theme for today, actually. How to how to be with what is, uh, rather than worrying about what could be. <laughs> you know, I was listening to uh, Annika Harris, uh, the meditation teacher, author, um, happens to be married to Sam Harris, who's also one of my favorite meditation teachers and, and thinkers at the moment. Uh, and um, Annika was talking about, you know, in, in times like these, it's quite easy to um, to kind of, you know, metaphorically or imaginatively kind of put our hands across our eyes and try to kind of block out what's going on. Um, and uh, and in fact, that that's a go-to reaction for a lot of us when we are encountering something that's uncomfortable, uh, anxiety, stress, uh, a worry with our health, uh, some level of frustration, um, it's tempting to kind of just try and block it all out with a kind of big emphatic no. Um, and uh, and that's so understandable because who would want to stick around with any kind of pain or anguish or emotional discomfort? Uh, and, and yet there may be other ways of encountering the same discomfort, if not with joy, then with a... Um, a resolute, a resolution to sit with things and um, get to know them, to develop a gentler kind of knowing or awareness where the the goal isn't to escape the discomfort as quickly as we can, but rather to perhaps listen to what it has to say. Um, why I bring this up is... Uh, I've listened to a lot of teachers across the weekend, uh, a really great conversation between Jack Cornfield, uh, who you, you may know, um, he's a bit of a legend in this field, and um, and the aforementioned Sam Harris. And uh, the the two of them are chatting, uh, it's it's like a q and I think it's the third of, the, third of them that they've done. Um, and uh, people are asking all sorts of questions, and I suppose one of the themes that comes up is, you know, mindfulness, is that it? Uh, is the ultimate goal to achieve some level of mindfulness? Um, and uh, Jack's answer is interesting, but it, if effectively it's an emphatic, no, <laughs> that's not it. Uh, obviously, it's absolutely possible to, uh, and we all know examples of um, whether you watch the Osho documentary, um, Wild Wild Country, or uh, are indeed familiar with just about any guru who's fallen from grace. Uh, it is seemingly possible to be uh, spiritually awakened or enlightened and um, uh, very much wanting in other areas of one's life. So um, it, to achieve mindfulness, to achieve the ability to uh, sit quietly with an expansive awareness um, and a real understanding of thoughts being passing sensations as are the sounds around us as is the um, feeling of having a body etc to be uh, in some senses enlightened and awakened when it comes to understanding how consciousness works uh, is not to say that you're enlightened or awakened when it comes to your relationships with people, uh, the the way you act in the world, the um, uh, the way you deal with money or substances or power or you know pick your vice or arena of sort of human experience, and it's clearly not just awareness. Awareness, uh, you could be very very good at sitting in a quiet corner while your family rages around you, but um, 
you know, sort of achieve a uh, somewhat beautiful but selfish goal of sort of rising above it all or being outside it all or understand how it is all just passing experience and yet kind of suck at being a member of that family um, through your lack of engagement. So Jack's idea uh, is really that if you, you go like right back to the way that um, uh, the original terms for meditation, um, uh, sattva or sati or smriti, depending on the Pali or Sanskrit or or just my memory right now, actually, uh, there's a there's a longer phrase uh, sati sajanya, um, uh, which which essentially is mindful response. So the idea, a little bit like in in Zen, there are only really two instructions in Zen. One is to sit upright or to sit. And the second instruction is to tend to the garden. Uh, It's not enough just to attain a level of mindfulness and think, that's it, I've achieved my goals. It is, um, we are becoming still. So that we give a space to um, recognize, to have insight, to be inspired in how we want to be in the world. So we're not really having to choose between this sort of being or doing. We are being still on a regular basis to inform the action, to ha- perhaps allow us to be a little less reactive and a little more uh, responsive or reflective in the way that we act. So, and uh, and, wh- and when we're doing that, we have then the option to further inform our practice through love. Uh, now, if the word love kind of turns you off, then uh, pick another one, uh, compassion or kindness. Uh, as Jack Cornfield says, this kind of kind attention or a loving awareness is what really transforms a mindfulness practice. Um, we can all get a mindfulness practice going, but you will get there more easily and faster if you do it through a lens of kindness. If you understand that the ultimate goal is not uh, emptiness or nothingness, but rather it's to realize how deeply connected you are to the world around you, how to be able to give it your full attention and awareness such that there is no great distinction between yourself and the world itself is to fill yourself with love or aliveness or kindness. And so to kind of imbue this uh, quality of mindfulness with kindness is to do yourself an enormous service. Kind of gets you out of the realm of treating meditation like uh, exercise that you have to do and gets it into a place where you're actually cultivating and practicing being in a condition of pure love so that you can then go out into the world and share that quality or tap into it a little more often when you are with other people. So I just wanted to end with a couple of readings, actually. Uh, One is a poem by Wendell Berry called The Peace of Wild Things which I think captures uh, the essence of mindfulness very beautifully. Uh, And if you ever kind of get caught in the thinking trap that mindfulness is some kind of escape or, you know, that it's a way of sort of unplugging from reality, then I want to uh, encourage you to come back to this poem and perhaps come back to the idea that... um, Rather than unplugging, it's really a way of plugging in. It's really a way of connecting ever more deeply with the beauty of being alive, being on this world. So here's the poem, The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me, 
and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world, and am free. For a time I rest in the grace of the world, and am free. Not free of the world, not free of your concerns, but free in the world, alive, connected, able to appreciate what is. Uh, and one more reading that I've been finding to be really, really powerful at the moment, and we might come back to in more detail in another session. This is chapter 22 from the Tao Te Ching. If you want to become whole, let yourself be partial. If you want to become straight, let yourself be crooked. If you want to become full, let yourself be empty. If you want to be reborn, let yourself die. If you want to be given everything, give everything up. The master, by residing in the Tao, sets an example for all beings. Because he doesn't display himself, people can see his light. Because he has nothing to prove, people can trust his words. Because he doesn't know who he is, people recognize themselves in him. Because he has no goal in mind, everything he does succeeds. When the ancient masters said, if you want to be given everything, give everything up, they weren't using empty phrases. Only in being lived by the Tao can you be truly yourself. To really succeed at a meditation practice, you need to let go of the effort to succeed. It's a paradox. One we're going to keep on coming back to. That to achieve the fullness you so desire, you might need to empty yourself. That to achieve recognition, you should seek none. It reads a little bit like a Zen koan, and meditation can feel like that. A kind of quest that could only be successful if we let go of the idea of the quest. And a practice that asks more questions than it's able to answer. But perhaps that's just the point, to keep on asking the questions. Who am I? What do I want from life? What does it mean to be alive? And to keep on coming back to those questions as we deepen our practice. Let's finish by taking a deep, slow breath in through your nose. And out through your mouth. And once more on those, just 
letting go of any tension in your body with a sigh. And I want to say thank you so much for joining for another session of Levitate Live. Uh, it means a lot for me to have you here with me practicing. Wish you a very beautiful day. Find out more about what Levitate does at www.levitate.london. Hit the subscribe button watch some of our other videos or leave a comment below and let us know what you think and we'll see you back here soon thank you